All right, so we're just getting the morning started today with the uh, auto lease like we always do. Uh, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about how important water temperature is to mixing your doughs. When I first started all of this, uh, it's just three years ago, it's summertime. Uh, the bakery that I took over was still extremely rudimentary in its development. And it's because really proof has, from its start, grown very organically. Uh, no one had a crazy amount of capital uh, to invest in this operation when it was first started. So this really is an example of a business that was started with very, very little uh, and has earned its, its own keep. Uh, so with that said, when we were mixing doughs three years ago by hand, there wasn't a whole lot of tools in the bakery to use. The processes were still younger and less developed. Uh, I really like to talk often about how we stand on the shoulders of giants that came before us. Recently it was Father's Day and uh, I was just reflecting on all the things that my dad did. In, in a similar way, the original baker, Jared, had to start somewhere and he started really from the very beginning. When he passed his processes on to me, they weren't finished. I don't think that he would have ever considered them finished. A lot of people have a hard time understanding in our story that that evolution really has never stopped. So from that day forward that I stepped into the bakery the first time three years ago, there's always been a development process happening. Water temperature was added afterwards. So I'm taking a thermometer here and I'm going for low 80. So right now it's 81 degrees and I'm going to take it. Now that's a summertime temperature for us and it's based on where I want my final dough temperature to be. Now what's the other factor is water temp or flour temperature. So the most influence to the temperature in the dough is going to be the ingredient that has the most mass in the dough. It's flour for sure. And so taking the temperature of my flour, it's actually also at 81 degrees. So by having water at 81 degrees in a spiral mixer in particular, because the mixer itself is a really, really important factor in deciding water temperature, this is appropriate, 81 degree water. The reason being is that this mixer is not going to increase the temperature of the dough much at all. Uh, if it does, it will be by one or two degrees maximally. Uh, so we sort of, we, we want the water to uh, be about where the final dough temperature is gonna be with the spiral. Now I'm also gonna be mixing sandwich dough next door in the planetary mixer. And there's no way that I could get away with 81 degree water in that particular mixer. The temperature increases a ton during the mixing process. So more appropriately, I'm going to be shooting for water temperature that's in the mid 60s so that there's plenty of room for the dough to increase in temperature before I remove it. We're going for final dough temperatures in the mid 80s. 84, 80 to 84 degrees is a range that I really like to shoot for. In the winter time, I don't mind if my final dough temperature in the mixing bowl is pushing 90 because by the time I get it out of the mixer and into the bins, it's in the mid 80s because the temperature in here is so low. In the summertime, I spent the entire evening cooling the bakery and I went through great lengths uh, by doing things like putting these, uh, these tent walls, they're camping tent walls in between the rooms. We don't have air conditioning in the newer areas of the bakery, like that new addition yet. It's a future project and so this is one of the best ways that we can trap the cold air in this room right now. Actually today uh, we have a shipment of the of a massive roll of these polar plastic uh, sheets 
uh, that typically go in between refrigerator doors. Uh, and I bought, I believe, like 300 feet of this stuff so that I can actually line the walk-in doors as well as uh, the doorways in between the rooms. So we are going to upgrade from the more, uh, well, less refined uh, tent wall to something that looks a little bit more professional. And, and that, I, that's an interesting point to something that's very regular around here. I do actually get a little bit personally offended at comments that uh, talk about this space sort of negatively. Uh, and, and the reason being is that if anybody was around here in the beginning and sort of was around here through the entire journey, I think that they would be much less likely to comment on this space. Um, what's sort of ironic is that cottage bakeries are very easy to explain and rationalize at their smaller levels, meaning when you're in your home's kitchen and when you're doing things at an ex extremely small level. That's what most people can uh, associate with cottage baking. Uh, oddly though, what I found when we were at that level, most definitely, we did not have the infrastructure in place to adequately manage baking at any scale efficiently. I, I mean, from every angle, from keeping things clean, keeping things organized. It takes tools and resources to do all these things. And so over time, we've accumulated them. But again, this is a very organically produced enterprise. So the idea of having strips between the rooms to uh, control temperature is awesome, but has taken time to uh, get to that stage. We still had a garage door between these two spaces just a few months back. Uh, so I'm tearing this, this uh, bucket right now so that my scale shows zero. I've got my 80 degree water and now I'm going to do my water measurement for this sourdough mix that I'm doing. We're mixing our standard uh, full size mix, which is pretty uh, common for us on a daily basis. So this first measurement is 17 liters of water. Uh, I'm going to take my total measurement, uh, which is a little over 35 liters of water, and subtract what I have so far. Now I have a difference. I'm gonna pour that water into my nice clean bowl. And now I'm ready with the next one, which is about four liters short. No worries. I'll add a little water into this bucket. This water is coming out of the tap at the exact temperature that I want. A lot of people ask about our water. We have a basic water filtration system uh, for the whole site. Uh, water runs through a softener because we have a lot of hard water here. Uh, and then we do have you know, access to filtered water, but we don't, we don't use the heavily filtered RO water for the mixing. We just use the lightly filtered and softened water. Uh, one of the reasons is, well, speed amongst others. I have storage tanks for the reverse osmosis water. There's, I think, four or five gallons stored in the bakery right now of RO water. We use it in our humidifiers uh, for, the, for the proofing chamber. We use it to drink out of. Uh, the rest of the water uh, uh, has been treated, but, but not all the way down to reverse osmosis. Um, so in case you're curious about about that. Now I'm getting close to the rest of what I need, which is a little over 18 liters. There it is. I've checked the weight on my flour bags and they are spot on right at 100 pounds. So I'm going to take this flour out now. This is our custom blend of flour from our local mill. It's a variety of local heritage grains uh, milled to what's considered a type 85 uh, milling rate. 
type 85 means that the the 15 percent uh, that's most coarse, which is primarily bran, uh, has been sifted out, leaving all parts of the wheat berry in place, bran, bran germ, and endosperm, but, but the coarsest parts uh, sifted out. We then use those coarsest parts again in our uh, baking process, and we dust the boards that, that the bread is on before it goes in the oven. That bran dust, if you will, allows the bread to slide off the boards into the oven and not get stuck or to them. Uh, that bran actually adheres to the bottom of the loaf's crust. So actually we are using a whole wheat deconstructed in that way. Now our, our flour is not 100% uh, whole grain. Uh, this particular blend is 50-50 between whole grain and white. Uh, I, I've talked about this in the past and it's really worth continuing the conversation on flour. There's a ton of misunderstanding generally about flour. Uh, a lot of sort of propaganda-like information out there. Uh, making white flour out to be public enemy number one. And while white flour by itself is really nothing to praise on its own nutritionally, it's not, not that it's nutritionally bad for us, but it sort of nutritionally lacks. It lacks flavor, it lacks nutrient density, but it's really good for a base structure for bread. So it's not that we're using white flour exclusively, but we're using white flour in our blends so that we get that kind of light texture that people want from bread, and also a nice predictable protein structure uh, since the mills have a really like refined way of creating white flour that's very consistent to the baker, time in and time out. So by going 50-50 on our flour blend, what we're doing is we're still giving our customers all parts of the wheat berry, all the benefits of the nutrient density from the stone milled flour, but we're creating this nice hybrid with some of the benefits of modern bread. We're not removing a hundred years of progress in bread making, uh, but rather we're leveraging the best of the progress in bread making over the last hundred years and combining it with the historical way that bread's been made, which is whole grain. Uh, I can't wait to show you some actually milled grains here because I think that we're going to get to a better understanding of milling after today in, in general, uh, and a contrast of whole grain and white flour. So I'm gonna set these aside for the recycling bin. Now, once again, we're doing the auto lease right now, so this is the combination of flour and water. I'm not trying to develop the gluten at all. All I'm trying to do is incorporate the flour and water together and allow time to strengthen uh, that, that initial dough before I add my Levon or prepared starter as well as my salt to it. So this mix is only going to go to the time that the flour is incorporated. Now, we didn't start this way. So going back to this idea of progress, uh, I remember the first time that I learned what an auto lease was. Uh, and it was actually in the first fall that we, were, that we were owners of a bakery. So go figure, I was a baker making hundreds of loaves of bread all the time, every week, and I had no idea what an auto lease was. I had this guest come in, it was a home baker uh, who was very well studied in the jargon of sourdough. Now, I didn't really learn that way. Uh, I'm very into I'm very into learning by the trial of 
of observation. And, and it, at the beginning, there's something about all of this that I wanted to make my own. I didn't want anybody to ever be able to later on say, oh, well, you just bought a bakery and took it over. So you're not really a baker. You just were taught all the things. So I'm pretty proud to say that none of our formulas, none of our processes, none of our recipes, hardly anything remains the same. I haven't touched English muffins. They're still their original formula. But everything else that we make is, has been modified, has been refined over time. And that's because originally I didn't really believe in just going out and watching others make bread and mimicking. And, and it's part of when I'm sharing our processes, I'm not really keen on just throwing out formulas. Will I ever share our exact formulas? Probably. However, please note that it's not about the formula that I have. It's more about baking daily, watching the observations that you can make, and making changes to where you're already at. You're going to have a much more rewarding experience if you bake this way. So I've still got some flour present. If you look at this bowl, you can see that some of the flour has not finished really incorporating. Uh, to me, that's, that means that the olive leaf isn't quite done. I just wanted to scrape the sides of the bowl uh, before continuing. So I'm gonna keep it running. Meanwhile, I'll get my hands clean. So back to progress, there was no auto lease in the beginning. I had this guest come in that really had studied sourdough and he asked me, do you auto lease? Like, what is this? Some sort of like new cool trend? Uh, and you know, I was a little worried about that question because I didn't want to sound like I didn't know what I was talking about. It's like, uh, nah. And then I started to rationalize on something that I had no idea. Of course, then, right around that time, I discovered Trevor Wilson's book on open crumb mastery. And so he was talking a lot about various types of dough development, amongst which auto lease was covered. Now, mind you, we were hand mixing three years ago. So we would come in and we would throw all the ingredients into this giant trough that the original baker had constructed from basically half of a barrel and uh, a table that had sort of been built around it. Uh, now, we would basically pour first dry ingredients, the flour, and then we'd pour the wet ingredients, the flour and the starter on top and mix all of that to really as far as we could. So, you know, I would basically pour all these ingredients into a bowl that was essentially the size of my entire sink and we would just dig our arms in and get to mixing. Uh, yeah, 15, 20 minutes would pass by. It'd be a full, you know, upper body back workout, no doubt. And we had very little to no gluten development really occurring. Uh, so right away as I was reading and researching, because while I didn't really believe in the short video content that you found on YouTube, it's why we love the type of content that we're putting out because for me, when somebody puts out a three or four minute video, it can be anyone. It can be an incredible baker that has incredible wisdom, but it can also be somebody that is baking their fourth or fifth loaf of bread They've had moderate success. Maybe they got lucky. Uh, and when you filter down the content to three or four minutes, you know, anybody can give you three or four minutes of tips. I didn't want to build a bakery based on that type of knowledge. I wanted to do the hard work of learning daily. Uh, and so really the, the observations that you make daily, they're not always so pointed. Uh, a lot of it just has to do with uh, you know, small little adjustments that you observe in your doughs. But what was on my mind in the early days was how can I get gluten development to happen 
at a decent rate to match uh, fermentation and to match the rise of the dough. So I found this to be sort of a problem of intersection because what I discovered early on was that time does something really cool. It develops gluten sort of passively in your doughs. The problem being that when you're mixing by hand, uh, once you incorporate a levon or starter into your dough, the time that it takes for gluten to develop often is longer than the time that it takes for the bread to rise to the point that you can shape it. So the intersection of those two events was a big challenge when we were mixing by hand. Autolise made all the difference. Uh, we did a modified autolise in the beginning. So we discovered about a year in through study and trial and error and reading uh, that if you added all the ingredients minus the salt that you could have, uh, sorry, all the ingredients minus the starter. So flour, water, and salt, uh, you could have something that Trevor Wilson refers to as a premix. Uh, a lot of the same gluten strengthening properties of an auto lease, but the timing of which was diminished and slowed down. So now I could take that premix and it could be done all night. So what we started doing was incorporating ingredients by hand for one or two minutes, just like I did in this bowl at a smaller scale. So we'd line bins on a table, the entire table's worth, and I would just get the water into all the bowls, get the flour into all the bowls, and mix for one or two minutes each, each bin until it was kind of at this shaggy state. And we would add salt, we would let these things sit for a couple hours and we would refrigerate the bins overnight and come back to them the next morning. By the next morning, the gluten was so well developed and we added the starter. Within four hours, we ended up having results that are similar to our results with the mixer today. So we settled on that process. But the cool thing is we took our entire bakery operation, which at the time was already mixing for three farmers markets on a Saturday, uh, and we were doing that all hand mixed. So if this guy ever breaks, granted, uh, I won't be thrilled uh, to go backwards, but in theory, we can scale back down. We can sort of deal with the adversity of uh, our somewhat old technology in this, in this second hand mixer breaking and not break our business along the way because we have done the hard work of scaling up uh, before that. So I've got this going now. Uh, we have one other auto lease to start and that's going to be the sandwich mix. Uh, for this, I'm just going to get a quick reference on, on my water content. I'm looking for 15, 15 and a half liters roughly of water here. Now, I have a little bit of a trick up my sleeve because we're going towards the planetary mixer now. So I need colder water. I stuck this bucket of water last night into my walk-in cooler, which has a low temperature. And so this water, which I removed from there about an hour ago, is at 54 degrees. I'm looking for water in the mid 60s, ideally. So what I'm gonna do is take some of this water, which is still 80 degrees, and it's going onto my teared scale. So that is 4,300 grams or 4.3 liters. I'm going to start adding this cold water to it. And we're going to get up to the 10 liter mark this way. Mix it up. And I'm going to get a temperature reading now. So we're actually at 65 degrees right now, which is perfect. Although I need to add five more liters. I need two different temperatures really to do that because I have 55 here. So it's critical that I get a little bit more 80 degree water. Let's see if this water is still coming out where I want it.
Yeah, it looks great. Right now I'm getting 78 as a reading and keep in mind that I'm going for 65 and I don't have any fancy water dosing uh, tools. You know, the next level up for us is to turn, to take our water lines here and connect the, the end of our water lines, both hot and, and chilled. So if I put in a chiller for, for my cold water supply and I can bring the cold water temperature down, then at the very end of the water lines, I can put something called a water doser in, which you basically tell it how much water you want it to dispense and the temperature you want it to dispense at, and it does this part for you, uh, which maybe one day. It's, they're expensive. They, just a small little box that you install on the end of your water lines, I, I believe the pricing I found is several thousand dollars. So it's not an expense that we have decided is uh, practical yet, uh, when there's other really expensive things still to buy. But one day, uh, maybe when I have nothing else to buy or when it just becomes a point that there's too many errors happening on water temperature. So uh, for a larger bakery that has more crew members mixing, it's a way to ensure consistency amongst crew members uh, in something as important as temperature control. But for us, Typically, it's just me and one other person that's doing all the mixing. And so this is just something that would be a personal luxury to me. Uh, and personal luxuries are not that important uh, when building a community business. They actually really need to be sacrificed for a little while. There will be time later on in my life, hopefully, to slow down and have a little bit more personal luxury. So now I have a perfect 65 degree water and I just need 200 more grams to get to the end. And this means that by combining 65 degree water with 80 degree flour, I'm actually still going to be starting this mix in the low 70s. I want it to end in the low 80s. And so this mixer is then being given basically a 10 degree heat up range. Depending on how long you mix, how deeply you develop your dough in the mixer, you're going to have to change your water temperature accordingly. So we tend not to overdevelop our doughs when mixing. We tend to do a lot of the work with passive time. Uh, so for us, 10 degrees is enough of a buffer, but it's probably on the low side for planetary mixers. So if I was to give any just general advice, be uh, you almost probably want to aim for your starting ingredients, the average temperature to be closer to that 65 range for a planetary mixer like this. So this applies all the way to home bakers using a KitchenAid in their homes because those are also planetary mixers. Uh, one, so sort of relating further to uh, all scales of this type of mixer, we can, we can sort of transition this discussion into one about mixing speed. So, I think that when you're not baking bread regularly, even if you bake other types of things regularly, uh, maybe you make whipped cream or, or meringues, you're used to using the higher speeds on your, on your mixer setup probably more frequently. And it's very tempting to shortcut the process uh, by throwing on the high gears. But I'll tell you, I have not mixed bread dough uh, more than once or so just to see what happens on a speed above two on these bigger machines and on the the home kitchen aids it's I think more like a two or three as well it starts to move really fast as you slide that thing over uh, and 
the faster that you're rotating that dough hook, the more that you're tearing at the gluten development that's happening. And so you're countering your work. I sort of wonder, I don't know if there's any truth to this, but I wonder if one of the reasons that the general public fears over mixing bread so much is because there's been a lot of people out there at their homes, uh, especially that have been tempted and have gone into higher gears. The thing about developing dough is what's, what's really taking place is that when flour and water combine, they are, uh, they are combining into this protein structure that, that is gluten. Uh, and that protein structure is a bond that at first strengthens into like this web. Uh, it's kind of neat to think about. Really think about like a, think about a web that just gets more and more layers with, with new layers of strands, it, say going in the opposite direction with each layer. So you have this really strong and more and more resistant uh, thing in, in gluten development. Well, so that same exact process is happening uh, in the mixer and passively, and it's definitely a bell curve. So gluten will develop strength, and then over time it will start to weaken and break apart. Well, by artificially breaking the gluten strands apart with your dough hook, when you go into the highest gears, you're, in sense, over mixing your dough right away. Because as you tear the gluten strands, you're doing the same thing that's going to happen naturally 20 or 30 minutes later. So uh, there is, there's a test that mills actually use. It's called a farinograph. And I think I'm saying that wrong, but I'm going to go with it. Somebody can correct me down below in the comments. But uh, I think it's a farinograph test. Um, we're going to have to talk, we're going to have to get that exact verbiage from, uh, from the mill when we go. But basically it's a test that measures how long you can mix a given flour at a given protein level before it begins to break apart. So they're basically the way the test is run is in a mixer where the dough is just mixed together, just flour and water and the dough is combined, it gets strong, and then it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps building strength until that breaking point when finally you reach a peak in the bell curve, and then everything you do thereafter is, is the downward part of the bell curve where now you're starting to break that gluten apart. Now, you don't need a mixer to experience this. Uh, you can experience this passively with time where if your dough ferments too long, it starts to lose its strength. And so really timing is, is critical uh, as a result of all of this. So now I've got my flour and water in this small mixer. It's on speed one. I'm gonna let it continue. Notice I didn't add all the flour all at once. I got the mixer going uh, for a brief moment before adding the rest. And that's primarily because we really do push the capacities on our mixes. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this mix is slightly over the recommended capacity for this mixer, uh, but it's so convenient because it's exactly one bag of flour and we can do it so long as we add our flour uh, in two parts because the, the over capacity aspect is very, very minimal. Um, so now that that's going, I'm going to take it to the same level as the other one. In speed one, it's not really going to build temperature very much. Uh, temperature seems to increase in doughs as they develop in structure as well. So uh, as the gluten comes together into that interlocking web and gets strength, there is more friction that's produced as it's spinning in the mixing bowl and that's when it's really gaining temperature, uh, especially in this one. Because of the style in which this bowl operates, where the entire bowl moves counter to the, the dough hook, the, the action in this mixer is generally gentler. Uh, and as a result, it just has less friction on the dough as it develops, 
which is why this one doesn't seem to build strength. My other, or not build strength, doesn't seem to build temperature like the planetary one. I want to clarify though that we might not be using our spiral as intended to some extent. When we first got our spiral mixer, it was completely broken. Um, we went out to California, drove our old box truck, which by the way, it was like its final voyage because it was falling apart. It was an auction truck. It had a lot of issues, but we made it all the way to California and back. And we got this mixer and a couple other secondhand pieces uh, somewhat early on. Um, is about a year and a half ago now um, but the mixer was broken it was in a in basically I guess where restaurant equipment goes to die type uh, place uh, this entire control panel every every electrical fitting was fried so the way that it was intended to run is that you set a time for timer one which was also speed one you hit start and it ran in speed one. And then you set another time for speed two, which was timer two, and so when timer one was exhausted, timer two engaged. Well, neither of these timers worked, and we went to our electrical supply store and we tried to find these original components. This mixer has long been discontinued by Hobart, so we couldn't find original components. Instead, we basically put in our own custom switches that we could find. And so we were only able to, in sort of haste, I'm sure we could restore this fully, but in haste we were only able to restore a single speed on this mixer. I think it's the low speed, which is probably one of the reasons why when we mix in here, there's no temperature increase. So don't take my words completely to, uh, to the nth degree because maybe if your spiral mixes faster than mine, maybe you can't put water in it that's at the final dough temp. But for us, that's how we've modified our equipment to work. And so again, that probably gives you a little bit of a lesson in and of itself and that's use your equipment to your own specifications, to your own parameters. This is really a science experiment every time you go to bake and you need to fit the scientific parameters that you need, meaning the temperatures that you need, not just fit what everybody else is telling you to do because their equipment might be slightly different than yours. Uh, at least, I don't know, maybe, maybe those of you watching all have been able to purchase uh, brand new equipment from day one and maybe you all are blessed with those type of resources. For me, it's been a journey of going from the same way of baking that our ancestors did, where I'm pretty sure we could have literally inserted an old time baker of, of the medieval age into our original bakery and they would have felt right at home. All I would have to do is justify electricity, just the one modern thing of electricity. Everything else was pretty much rudimentary. Um, well, we had, to, we, we went from that level here. So along the way, we have not just immediately graduated to the best of the best of the best in equipment. So it's time now to add the rest of our ingredients to these uh, two mixes that we have. I've only got one last thing to prep. I spent some time uh, last night actually prepping some of the extras that are going into today's mixes, but I forgot one mix of flour prep. So I'm going to quickly measure out this flour at right on the money at 2% baker's percentage. This is a cease. Did I say flour? This is not flour. This is definitely salt. Everything about it is salt. Uh, so 2% uh, salt to flour. And it's the one thing I didn't really have prepped for these mixes, so I'm just gonna get this set. This one comes out to a little over a kilo, which is a lot of salt, but that goes to show just how big this mix is. Um, it's now very easy to forget 
what a luxury it is to have a spiral mixer. Uh, I, I'm not gonna forget the day very easily that we put this into production because on that day, I gained back a lot of my time. Uh, we can mix 120 loaves in this guy uh, in one go. Uh, and prior to that, we had the spiral or the planetary, which can only mix 40. So you have to do three times the mixing in the planetary to get to the spiral. The 40 was the first size mixer, in my opinion, that makes any sense to use in production beyond hand mixing for a bakery. If you are making less than 40 loaves at a time, you can use a small mixer, no question. But I think that there's a huge, huge benefit to mixing by hand below that level. Not only do I think that you will more likely scale up the amount of bread you're making, if you can get yourself into a mode of mixing by hand, because you won't have that barrier. See, a small mixer will tell you, oh, well, I can only mix 10 loaves in here so I can't really go beyond 10 loaves. And because we seem to have a thing about not wanting to take on more physical work than we already used to doing, like it is difficult for me to conceptualize going backward to a hand mixing world. So by not allowing yourself to mix on a mixer until you have mix sizes that make sense, um, you're going to learn a lot more about your dough. You're going to have a much better relationship with it. And you'll also have a better historical context to how baking was for everyone else who's ever had to bake bread other than our modern generation. So also, it's just faster at a certain point. If I'm going to mix bread in a 20 quart mixer, um, which can only get maybe 12 kilos of dough. 12 kilos of dough is like 15, 15 or so loaves. The amount of work I have to do to get the mixer ready and then clean up the mixer after, after myself, I would have already had more bread mixed by hand. So I do think that there is a break point that's natural. And so I would not recommend going out and buying buying a $5,000 20-quart mixer for bread. Uh, we have a 20-quart mixer. We did not buy it new. And we bought it first because it was the first thing that ever came up available on auction as far as a mixer. Uh, it was more expensive on auction than our bigger mixers, ironically. So I spent on auction $1,200 for this 20-quart mixer, whereas on an auction, this is before I put any money into fixing them back up, but let's just use my winning bid numbers. 1,200, 800, 1,100. So the most expensive mixer was the one that actually we couldn't really use for bread. We, we were still hand mixing after we purchased that for eight months. The only thing we did in it was mix like fillings, beat eggs, that kind of thing. It's useful for that, uh, but not really for mixing dough seriously. It's just too small. I'm gonna do my morning meditation. I'm feeling quite good today, so let's just give it a smiley and get this guy going now. Meanwhile, I've already done some of the legwork for my other mix, my sandwich mix requires uh, milk powder, which is just dehydrated milk, requires salt, and it requires brown sugar in addition to the flour and water. At the end, I'm also going to add water, uh, butter. And whenever I use butter, it's the last thing that goes in the mixing bowl. And it goes in the mixing bowl when other things have already developed and I've got a nice strength going. So I'm dropping the mixing bowl now. And I've got my prepped brown sugar. I've got my prepped milk powder and salt. I'm gonna combine the three really quick. 
And by doing this, I'm breaking up some of the clumps in the brown sugar. And as I break down those clumps, they're going to incorporate a little bit better for me. Uh, I'm always trying to prevent things from clumping. It's not really all that scientific or all that advanced, but it's one of those things that it's an attention to detail thing that will make a big difference in your doughs. Fix the things that you can fix in your mixing. So we're always worried about the things that we don't know yet. I do the same thing. I want to know all about the intricacies of rye fermentation, for instance. It's an area of interest for me. I, I have a fairly, I have an okay understanding. I've spent maybe, maybe four or five months regularly working on rye breads and rye sourdough breads, but it's a very different learning curve with new information. And it's tempting to sort of feel like, oh, well, I wish I knew what I don't know. I wish I, I could do what so-and-so does. Uh, along the way, there's a lot of little things that anyone could do that we often overlook. But because this is such a science, uh, the little things end up mattering a whole lot. So something as simple as making sure that when you incorporate all of your ingredients into your bowl, they incorporate evenly and fully, it's a big deal. So anything you can do surrounding your mixing technique to do so is important. So going through that a little, there's a baker in, uh, in the Bay Area of San Francisco, uh, I believe it's Los Gatos, uh, there's a Michelin star restaurant called Manresa, and they own a bakery next door, Manresa Bread. The head baker there, at least before, her name is Avery, and I saw her give a, a lecture on sourdough donuts. And because the, the dough was heavily enriched with sugar and butter, she sort of meticulously went through her mixing technique, which stuck with me ever since. Uh, a lot of it had to do with basically taking your core ingredients, flour and water, and making sure you have development before adding every bit of inclusion. So uh, anything above flour and water, she considered inclusion. And she had a very particular way of only incorporating the rest in parts before introducing the before introducing more and and in doing so making sure that the dough strength was was not affected because keep in mind that when you add things outside of flour and water you are changing the structure of that dough you're changing its makeup so different ingredients strengthen dough, whereas different ingredients weaken dough. Some ingredients grab moisture into dough, some ingredients, uh, some ingredients have completely different effects. So one of the best tips I can provide is a really, really simple one. It's when you're adding new ingredients into your dough, Add them in smaller amounts and be sure that they don't get stuck on the sides and clump before finishing your mixes. And this is really as simple as approaching this with a little bit more patience and observation. So I'm watching as I'm putting this stuff in and I'm checking to see whether it's going to clump up on the sides. I see that it did. Brown sugar is kind of notorious for it, which is why I'm being careful to begin with. Most of that first bit did incorporate, so I'm adding a little more now. Meanwhile, I've got this guy going, and you can see that the dough hook is starting to grab that dough and stretch it. I'm looking in the center there as I try to judge when to cut the mix here. 
Uh, in reality, I could probably already cut it, but what I'm trying to do is develop just enough strength. Now, uh, there's probably going to be a huge amount of debate between bakers as to what exact degree you want to mix your dough to. It's yet another variable. If you have all the variables surrounding it controlled, meaning you have your temperatures under control, you've got your timings under control, you've got your fermentation of your sourdough starter under control, then you can start to play around with this variable and see, okay, well, if I mix a little bit more, what's the effect on the rest of the process? So we have a particular range that we have liked that produces good results for us, and I'm still a couple minutes away. Meanwhile, I can add more now. Th this is brown sugar that got clumped. Um, and it's probably because the sugar's just a little bit older than I want. Uh, so I'm just gonna use my fingers to break that, those pieces, and I've been able to do that, so that way it will smooth back out in the dough. Um, so I'm somebody that really is motivated by change, by development, by progress. But there's something that we've been discussing more and more. Uh, well, really, we've been discussing from the, from the very beginning. Prior to proof, when I was doing, I guess, more of a traditional type of business, it was technology-based, so software-based. Uh, it seems to be more trendy than, than a baking business. Uh, and Amanda was working uh, in a corporate office. We often discussed uh, in the beginning days, well, what, yeah, we often had this idea, well, business is just something that you scale and you make the most that you can in revenue and the most profit, and that's what a good business is. I don't really have that view anymore, especially after going through three seasons of growth. So proof is roughly twice the size it was a year ago right now. And a year ago, it was roughly twice the size that it was a year before, which was roughly twice the size that it was the year before. So three times that we've gone through that. And that's, that's an insane exponential curve to live through. It sounds all peachy from the outside because it just sounds like, oh, well, more money. The expression of more money, more problems is true, especially when you've lived through it. There's no such thing as growth without expenditure. And if you're growing too fast, actually Jeff Bezos recently uh, talked about this uh, in some media article I was reading about how he feels like Amazon is stuck in this perpetual loop of having to invest its profits into growth. And whether that's true or not is debatable. I don't want to get into a debate on the profitability of something like Amazon, but I can firsthand from a tiny, tiny uh, micro bakery say that growth is expensive and it can be crippling in and of itself. Um, so you can outgrow your own resources. If you grow too fast, then the resources that you're accumulating are wasteful. So you're buying resources that then you're outgrowing before they reach their end of life. And that's where your profitability really starts to be called into question. Uh, so, you know, an example of this is suppose that this was a brand new piece of a machinery, which we do have some, like that dough sheeter over there across the room was a brand new piece of a machinery when we bought it. And so the price tag was above $10,000. So it can only do what it can do and we're nowhere near its capacity right now. But if we keep growing at twice, at a doubling every year, well, it's not gonna take very long to outgrow that. And the thing is the, the usable lifetime for that dough sheeter is probably over a decade. So if I outgrow it in two or three years, now my ten, twelve thousand dollar investment can't be spread over the twelve year period. Now it's spread over a three year period. And if I divide it by the amount of product that I've run through that sheeter, well now my profit margins have really lowered because of what? Growth. 
So it's really important to gauge growth smartly. And for us, we're also looking at it from another layer entirely and saying, well, will growth eventually lead to a change in the overall quality of what we do and the overall message that we bring out to the world? Uh, will growth prevent people from learning to bake more because of more automation? What's the appropriate amount of automation that protects quality and consistency, uh, but also empowers human beings to learn this craft of baking? Um, I think that all of those things have different limits and different answers. And for us, we've reached a really interesting level here um, in, in this particular setup. And now we're sort of transitioning to uh, doing things like our entire business used to be surrounded by Saturday. So everything we did was Saturday. 95% uh, of our revenue was Saturday. Uh, we did produce all week, but just much lesser amounts. Uh, the pandemic sort of changed that for us uh, where we started to roll out a delivery service and now we are slowly catching up to Saturday on other days. We're nowhere near that yet, but this year growth is not going to be doubling again. It's actually just going to be balancing and sort of hedging Saturday with other days. Uh, so that if it rains on Saturday, we don't lose all the money for the week that we need to make. The idea of rain, which is rare here in the desert southwest, is such a stressful one. Because if it rains on Saturday morning during farmer's market hours, we could see 40% of our weekly revenue wash up just because of that. Now, that might not mean anything other than a number, but keep in mind that we have several family member families that we support from this bakery. So the idea of losing 40% of our revenue on a week along with all the waste because we can't really just suddenly stop producing because of rain, we can't always accurately forecast the rain either, uh, it's stressful. So by being able to spread out to multiple days, which is what we're doing now, that's kind of our next phase. We're trying to prevent outgrowing this space for a little while at least. Uh, for us right now, that little while is, is years in length. We wanna be able to pay off our investments. We wanna be able to profit a little bit from our investments and then sort of reevaluate. And to us, this is what growing a business in a sustainable and historically normal way is all about. I think that I think that as we see the, the crash and expansion of our macro economy, we ought to start considering what is it like to build a business that stands the test of time. Uh, I'm pretty passionate about this. I'm probably more passionate about this than about bread production itself. The idea of not falling into the trap of the boom and bust cycle, not just building things based on momentum and then seeing them crash and burn. I, I look at kind of the food industry in particular right now and say so much of the industry is built upon this notion of borrowing capital from uh, rich organizations or property management organizations or landlords, spending that borrowed capital and building your entire business based on a lease structure where all your margins are kind of that razor thin amount at the end. There's really very little equity that's being built up in your infrastructure over time. And so when we do have these global shakeups, people are talking about the, the restaurant industry disappearing now. We're talking about 80% of restaurants potentially not recovering based on this global pandemic that we're seeing. And I would argue that it has much less to do with the talent and skill and good food that's in the restaurant industry and all to do with the way in which the industry is built. Um, if restaurants were built the way that I imagine family restaurants were built 50, 60 years ago, you would have families doing more of an organic buildup like we're doing. But there's really no regulation right now that provides a pathway from small pop-up to brick and mortar restaurant. 
in fact, that middle ground is where it gets iffy. If we focused on building pathways through that middle ground, because there is definitely a pathway for a food industry to pop up like we do at farmer's markets, that's typically where food-based businesses are, are uh, started, it's through pop-up events. But I think that we need to spend some time as we think about rebuilding now uh, into providing more regulatory pathways for people to be able to safely and legally produce in the middle so that they can build their own equity in their infrastructure and equipment. At least they can start buying their kitchen equipment before they go into a brick and mortar. Can you imagine the way this math works? So again, I've said this before and I'm gonna say it again. Typically people that are independently wealthy do not go into the food industry. And I think that the reason being is not that hard to understand. People who work in the food industry work 12, 16 hour days on their feet. If you already have what you need financially to pay your bills, the only reason you would do that is just pure passion. And I'm sure there's a lot of that out there. I'm not trying to say that, that no rich person has become a great restaurateur, but I'm trying to say that the industry probably is more marked by scrappy, younger, poorer people generally that are trying to work their way to something and as a result, I find it to be very predatory that these people end up putting their own homes as collateral in order to borrow money to buy equipment, which is also put up as collateral ultimately for the spaces that they lease. And then these leases become these crippling bills where if they have a seasonally driven business, part of the year they're not even paying their bills. All right, I spend some time around the state because I love to travel in normal times. Um, but Flagstaff or Northern Arizona in general is like this where there's this really big season for tourism and for going out. And then there's a slow season. And I just imagine all of these restaurants in the winter losing money in order to try to make up lost ground all summer and how much better it would be if on the whole the system more operators actually owned their real estate and owned their equipment. But we can't get there if we're impatient. We can't get there if we expect our restaurant owner operators to scale up into beautiful, modernized, contemporary looking brick and mortar spaces from day one. Uh, so. Next time you judge a book by its cover and you go into like this incredible, uh, let's say an incredible, you still see a lot more mom and pop uh, food operators uh, that are immigrants. So if, if I go into say the Asian cuisine, um, you'll find these kind of scrappy food businesses where you can tell that they actually own their stuff. And the way you can tell is because it's not all that pretty sometimes. You might have the restaurant that has cookie cutter tables and cookie cutter chairs. It's that hole in the wall, but it has amazing food because the kitchen is passionate. And you know what? Those are the kitchens that are probably going to survive because they own their stuff. So if they don't make money this month or next month, they don't have these massive debts to pay. So I'm a real proponent for building slow. That's what we're doing here, building slow. It seems like we've gone fast and, in, and we've gone fast because we haven't pushed the brakes enough. Um, proof has been something that the community has wanted. We're very thankful for that. We're thankful for just the momentum that we've gotten and the outpouring of support that we have. My job from the beginning has been pushing the brakes an adequate amount at the right pace. And I've never done a good job because I don't like pushing the brakes. So then I find myself dealing with more than we can take on. And so I've gone through many events in here where we've overstressed our crew. We've overstressed ourselves. I've been in regular fights with 
Amanda as we try to restore equilibrium and balance. So for us, this year is all about that. It's all about sort of looking at last year's data, trying to learn from it, trying to figure out how we can get through this coming holiday season without getting so overwhelmed, how we can do a better job keeping maintenance routines for our stuff so that our stuff doesn't break down. Uh, so we're looking at things that are not really all that valued in the business world right now. We're looking at how can we, how can we reach sustainable maintenance and not just hyper growth? Because it's not true that you can just sustain and hyper growth forever and ever and ever. I think that if we doubled again this coming season, that there would be at least a very high chance that Amanda and or I hit the point of burnout because we've teetered at that edge a number of times and have had to go through periods of sort of forced slowdown ourselves, relying more on our crew just to recover sort of mentally.